Welcome to the Virginia is for Laughers podcast brought to you by X2 Comedy. If you're looking to get more out of your Shenandoah Valley experience, then this is the podcast for you. You'll meet interesting people, the comedians that perform here, and find out more about what you can do and see. Whether you live here or plan to visit, listen to explore what helps make up our unique slice of heaven. Now here's your host, Dawn Davis Walmack. Hello, laughers. I'm thrilled to introduce you to Tassie Puppert, producer and host of Unwind at VPM, Virginia's home of public media on PBS. This show takes the viewer through the back roads of Virginia in search of Virginia's wines, including episodes featuring vineyards in our very own Shenandoah Valley. Tassie is a certified specialist of wine, certified chef, and a member of the VPM Media Corporation Corporate Board of Directors. With season four premiering January 22nd this year, you can explore local winemaking traditions and the rich history of wine in the Commonwealth. Along the way, you can learn a bit about modern wine production techniques and spend time in Tassie's kitchen, putting together some fantastic recipes that pair well with the featured wines. Welcome, Tassie. It's great to have you on the show today. Thanks so much for having me, Dawn. This is going to be fun. I know. It's so exciting. <laughs> For generous for laughers. <laughs> That's for sure. And what doesn't go well and pair wine even better than a bunch of laughs? I'll tell you that right, right. now. Right. That's right. If you're not laughing before, you'll be laughing after. <laughs> That's exactly right. Certainly one of my favorite hobbies for sure, too, is getting on the back roads of Virginia on a random Saturday or Sunday to explore these wineries. But I don't know a whole lot about pairing recipes with wine, so I'm very very excited to have you on today to talk about all things unwind. So let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> I think my first question is, is hearing the story of unwind. Was this a long time dream of yours to have a show like this one day? Or was it more like one thing led to another? Well, this is actually my third show. So um, I did a real estate show way back in 1990, I believe. 93. And then in, um, I only did it for a year, you know, the, the market was bad. And then 1994, I bought a store. It's a, it was gourmet, uh, food and wine store and VPM. Well, at the time, WVPT folks came into me and they saw that I was set up with a, a demonstration kitchen and they had this show called WVPT cooks and they didn't have a kitchen or anything. So they said, Hey, can we shoot our promo there? I said, sure, come on in. You can shoot your promo. I'd love to have you. You know, I've been involved in the station for a long time. And um, they came and shot the promo. And then I was one of the guests on their first show. It was a quarterly show around fun recipes uh, sent in by people in the Valley. And I was their first guest, first guest ever. It's the only guest they never recorded because they forgot to hit the record button. It was a brand <laughs> new show. And um, the day uh, after the show aired, it was a three hour live pledge show. The day after the show aired, the host came to them and said, well, my husband has been transferred to Portland, Oregon. We'll be moving in a month. So um, I'm afraid I'm going to have to step back from the show. And so they came to me and they said, well, we don't have it on record, but you did a great job. Would you, <laughs> would you consider being our host just until we launch a national search and we get somebody in? Well, I'm here to tell you, I did that show for 17 years. Oh my gosh. Did they get another host? But it was getting really old in that time. I was able to get, um, I was able to get uh, my certification in wine, my certification as a chef. And I thought, you know, what better way to use my certifications now to create something than, you know, with this show. And so I went to the then president over at uh, WVPT and I pitched him. He was all over it. It still took us maybe three years or so to get it up and on the air. 2016 in October, Kurt Hartman said, why don't you come here, shoot your pilot, let's see how it goes, and we'll pay for that season. Kurt Hartman, I love that man. Blue <laughs> I love him. So it all kind of came together in a really funky, almost spiderwebish sort of way. But um, 
you know, it was a it was a thought that I had in my head. I wanted to do a different show than WVPT Cooks because that was getting really old. Mm -hmm. And um, it just wasn't it just wasn't doing what it needed to do. And I was excited about this. Then in the meantime, WVPT merges with VPM down in Richmond. VPM is like, yeah, yeah, well, you know, we'll see how it goes. And then suddenly, you know, I, I now have an Emmy, we're an award-winning show and we're wrapped with season four and we're just waiting for April to see if we're going to be picked up for season five. It's really, it's really that kind of a weird sort of thing. Yeah, it's an incredible story. And you mentioned Kurt Hartman, you said Bluestone Vineyard. So that yes. was the first show. Yeah. That was the first show. And on that show, the first two seasons, what I did was 15 minutes of the vineyards and then 15 minutes with food. So with, with mm. Kurt's food, with Kurt's um, wines, I did a, a butternut squash soup and I did a salmon with a root vegetable puree and a reduced uh, Cabernet Sauvignon sauce. And both recipes still are some of my favorites from the show. But um, now the show is a little different. We, we we're quite sure what we were, you know, are you a cooking show? Are you a traveling show? Are you a show about wine? Ultimately we're a cooking show that involves wine and brings in our incredible agritourism of the wine industry. Yeah, I agree. I've watched some of these episodes in preparation for today and I'm blown away with the production value and just the whole show concept. So it's, you know, I was already excited to bring you on today and then and preparing for it. <laughs> I just oh, went out the room. Thanks, so. thanks, thanks, thanks. Well, I've got a really good team. We're small, but we're mighty. <laughs> That's all it takes. Talented yeah. people, you know, right. a small right. crew of talented people can do yeah. big things. Yeah. There's Absolutely. no doubt about that. And you, <laughs> and you guys are. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you're yeah. having, yes, you are having fun too. They, we are. You are having fun. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, there are five of us. There's me and my co-producer, Sherry, and then Ryan Berry, who is a wonderful local pro- producer who does a lot of things, comes in as our videographer, and he has one other videographer and then um, uh, an audio person, and they have the equipment. So we went from, you know, rinky-dink kind of cameras to 4K cameras. He look, makes us look really good. <laughs> really good. <laughs> I dream of that one day. Just saying. <laughs> I'm going to get you a 4K. <laughs> one day. That would be awesome. But in the meantime, let's talk about this show. I watched the I watched the promo clip for yeah. season four. Oh, Very yeah. fun. And someone refers to you, and I quote, as the next Gordon Ramsay of Virginia. <laughs> That is very fun. Where was that winery? And what do you think about being called that? That is my dear friend, Stephen Bernard over at Keswick Vineyards. That was the first day I'd ever met Stephen. And oh my gosh, we have become fast friends. And he is an incredible wine producer. He's from uh, South Africa and he really is into his food. So when he said that to me, I was like, Holy cow, this is kind of neat because I love Gordon Ramsay's food. I think he does an amazing job. And um, he uh, he paid me a great compliment that day. And um, and he is just a fun guy and loves his food. So when he said that, it meant a lot. Yeah. That's yeah. great. I would say your personality is a little bit different than Gordon's. <laughs> I'd like to hope so. <laughs> I love you, Gordon. Hello. Get it, to, get it right, young lady. Get it right. <laughs> it's certainly entertaining. And I understand off camera oh, with yeah. his family. He's a sweetheart. So oh, I understand that, too. Yeah. <laughs> I have but, former students who have worked with him. So, yeah. oh, you probably have some stories. <laughs> oh, yeah, they do. <laughs> Not me personally, but they do. All right. Well, maybe we'll interview them someday. But <laughs> exactly. Uh, how do you decide what vineyard you're going to do a show about and what goes into creating an episode about them? Wow. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, 
really it's uh, it's sort of organic. So my producer Sherry and I are all over the state just kind of exploring. We also have a great line with Richard Leahy, who was on our show in season three, and Richard knows all of the wineries. And then I, because I've made these relationships happen with a lot of the wineries throughout the state, they also want to recommend people, uh, wineries to go to. You know, are you looking for this or are you looking for that? This is where you can find it. And that really is quite helpful. Um, And I trust them. I believe in what they have to say. So a lot of that onus has really been kind of taken off of our shoulders. And um, once they suggest, then we go there and we scout it out. We look at it. And um, and then everybody comes to, we go to the winery. We'll go to the winery for about three or four hours, one morning early. We try to get all of our drone shots in early. Then we meet with the winemaker or whoever we're going to talk with and do a little tasting. I'm out of there in a couple of hours. The rest of the team is there for three or four hours to get what's called B-roll, all of that extra that you've got to throw in. And then um, we come back. I buy their wines. I come back to my kitchen and I just start throwing it down. You know, okay, I've got this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. And a lot of times I'll do this with six or seven wineries together because I want to try recipes. So I'll have three or four petite Verdots and I'll have two Cabernets and a couple of Merlots and all of these things. And then I'll make a plethora of food with all of these different sauces, all of these different flavorings, or I'll just grill several, several chicken breasts, steaks, salmon, whatever, And then I have all of these rubs and my husband and I will sit there with all of these glasses and taste this rub with that. No, it doesn't work. This rub with that kind of works. This rub with that. And we go through all of those wines. And then once I, I have that and I come up with the recipes, Sherry and the team come back and we spend um, anywhere from seven to one o'clock in a day, just filming the, the cooking. We only do it once. We're not, you know, a fancy show where they do it three times. Most most cooking shows do their recipes at least three times. So you're getting all the different camera angles. You get all the different bubbling. You know, if it didn't brown, hey, it didn't brown. So let's just move on. And I might say, you know what? In this case, it doesn't have to. So let's just let's just move <laughs> on. Let's just do it. Because we don't have the budget to be able to do that. And we don't have the time. I mean, frankly, this is this is just a part-time little thing for me. I teach full-time in the heart school and I'm very involved as a volunteer in the community. And I kind of look at this as one of my volunteer opportunities where, you know, even if they give me reimbursement for all the things that I'm, I'm uh, doing, all the foods and that kind of thing, I still feel like a lot of what I'm doing is, is give back. I I'm, I'm a big uh, community. I want to support my community. And I've been a, I've been with WVPT with PBS since 1975. So I've been doing this for 47 years, uh, just being involved. And so for me being able to give my expertise, you know, they pay me a little bit, but to give my expertise, to give my, my knowledge to everybody who wants to watch, to me, that is, um, it's a gift to me and hopefully it's a gift to the community. That sounds very rewarding. It's, oh, it's amazing. It's amazing. There's nothing like somebody coming up to your grocery, in the grocery store and saying, would you smell this lemon and let me know if it's ripe? Would you <laughs> check this, this melon and let me know if it's ripe? Can you check out my tomatoes for me? Sure, I'd be happy to. <laughs> This really happens in the grocery store? All the time. The grocery store is the place, baby. If they know me, they know me in the grocery store. So I better (laughs) darn well have clean hair and makeup on. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, let's go there for a second. What's the weirdest request you've ever gotten in the grocery store? Laughers want to (laughs) know. I had a guy have me sign his receipt one time and I just looked at him and I said, you know, this isn't worth much. I said, unless it's on the bottom of a check. And, you know, sometimes that might even be questionable. And he just looked at me and laughed. He said, nope, I'm framing this. And I said, great, great. Uh, that's great. And you can put underneath it the next Gordon Ramsay. Yeah. Also known as Gordon Ramsay of the Shenandoah Valley. That's right. I love it. 
<laughs> All right. Now we got to go back just a second on a couple of things in that answer to the last question one of them is is it just you and your husband tasting all this food yeah and, well sometimes uh, we'll have a little party we'll okay. make it an event and we, okay we have friends whose palates we really trust and they'll come over and 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 i'll tell them it's a tasting night that way they know don't eat all of that you know because another boy one is coming and and um and they really have amazing palettes and they are happy to help us really kind of sort through. And sometimes what they like is not what I like. That's another thing. You know, drink what you like with what you like to eat. Just do it. Just do it. You know, all the all those passe rules are kind of out the window. But um, you know, there are a few rules that you want to go to, but um, but not not a lot. Not a lot. You really want to enjoy what you're eating, what you're drinking. Bank, frankly, life is just too darn short to drink something you don't like with something you're eating because somebody says that that's what you should have. So, yeah. Ah. But no, uh, usually it's just me and Tom. But sometimes we invite friends. <laughs> that's good. I'm wondering. I don't know. Maybe I need to get you to trust my palate. <laughs> I'm also a spitter. I'm also a spitter. Uh oh. Yeah. So you know, I sip uh, it and then I spit it out, and that's that's the way I teach it. You know. So, uh, okay. But you know, because we go through a lot of wines. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Yeah. Well, I probably wouldn't spit it out, but. <laughs> I think some of my students try to fake that they've spit it out. So oh, yeah. His red solo cups are sometimes hard to hide a few facts. <laughs> yeah, I might or might not be one of those. <laughs> For real. I think you touched on something I wanted to ask you also before yeah. we move on. And that is the pairings yeah. of food with wine. I was just hearing you say kind of there are no rules. So what is the... I guess, expected knowledge or basic knowledge of pairings. And if you had a pro tip, what would it be? Yeah. I just want to expand um, on that thought a little bit more. Sure. The biggest thing is if it grows there, it pairs well with that wine. So if you're, if you're able to, if you're able to taste an amazing Sauvignon Blanc from the Loire Valley of France, what are some of the things that are common around there? Goats, goat cheese is incredible with um, Sancerre, which is um, Sauvignon Blanc from Loire Valley. So if if it's if it's grown there, they go they go there. So if if it grows together, it goes together. Um, and then the other thing, you know, you can always do the old white with chicken and fish and red with beef, but there is nothing quite like an amazing Merlot with a piece of salmon. Oh my gosh. It's just the best because it's a meaty fish. It has, you know, that oil in it. And, um, and if you, if you have a lot of acid in food, you want to cut it with a little creamier food, or you want to pair it with the same acidity. So what you're doing is either making them opposites or exactly the same. So if you're, you know, if you think about it as a seesaw, do they weigh the same? They're the same. You can get by with that. Or are they complete opposites? Do you have, you know, a 480 pounder with a 12 pounder up here? Then they kind of blend together as well. That's, That's a good tip. Yeah, 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 yeah. But if it goes, if it grows together, it goes together. That is a really good tip. I hadn't really thought about it before. And mm -hmm. then when you hear something like that, it just makes perfect sense. It's, yeah. Yeah. You know, it's that farm to table thing. Right. If you grow it here, it's going to taste the best. And if those grapes grow here, they're going to taste the best. So that's kind of the thing to go with. You know, that makes me think of another uh, just question about that. So we live in here in the Shenandoah Valley. What kinds of things are growing here that pair with wines here? Can you give us some examples? Yeah. So, you know, here in the Shenandoah Valley, we grow some amazing Cabernet Franc and it's used all over Virginia in other wineries. Wineries are buying grapes from the Shenandoah Valley. And that's because it goes so well with like beef dishes and that kind of thing it goes well with pork. So um, they're looking for wines that do better 
some grapes that do better here. They blend really well with other wines. Um, Petit Verdot grows super well over in that uh, Monticello AVA over near Charlottesville. It's amazing. Sauvignon Blanc will grow there so much better um, than other places. So also in Virginia, we have so many different soils and so many different microclimates. Every grape grows in a different climate. And You can grow grapes across the road from where I'm sitting right here at JMU. You can grow them across the road and you can grow them right where I am. And those two grapes, same grapes, are going to taste completely different because of the soil content, because of the angle of the sun. Winemakers know how to how to use that to their advantage. And uh, there is such an art to that and such a science. It's just amazing. Just amazing. Wow. I didn't even know that. Oh, yeah. This oh, yeah. Educational yeah. today. Oh, good. Good. That's what I do. I'm an educator. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you were going to say something. I don't want to miss it. What were you going to say? Oh, no. I was just going to say I, I take students to Napa Valley. Okay. And, and I have learned so much going to Napa Valley because it's 22 miles long. There are 17 American viticultural areas within that 20 miles of, of span, And every AVA, American Viticultural Area, has to have something totally different than the other ones around it. So in that 17 AVA area in 20 miles, there are 17 totally different. Here in Virginia, we have eight. We have eight. Yet even in one of those AVAs, you can have a block of grapes here and a block of grapes right beside them. They're still going to be totally different. The sun angles are different. The breezes blowing are going to be different. You know, what kind of stuff comes in? Grapes are their own natural pollinators. But what comes in as pollen to grow in that ground right there to replenish that soil? The replenishment of the soil is going to make it taste different. It's just, it's such an amazing thing to learn about wine and then to sit down and drink a glass and go, holy cow. All of that went into this little four ounce pour. And, you know, I can't believe that I'm, I'm able to discern some of those things now that I've studied it. Yeah. What's AVA again? American Viticultural Area. Okay. So there's a region or an area has a different yeah. AVA. Each area has a, a different AVA. Yeah. So Napa Valley in itself is one AVA, but then there are 17 smaller AVAs within that. That's amazing. Yeah. And you, you do work at Hartman School at James Madison University. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do there and what yeah. you teach? Yeah. Yeah. It's the Hart School for Hospitality, Sport and Recreation Management. And um, I teach all the culinary classes. I teach the wine studies and beverage management classes. And then I'm also getting ready to teach our, our senior seminar, which is um, it's a senior level leadership class where they're going to be learning some advanced culinary skills and they'll be learning about international cuisines. And then I'm also called upon uh, frequently to teach leadership. I used to teach events management, uh, but my, my plate was just too full to do it all. So, um, so now I'm really focusing on food and beverage. Yes. And can you share with the laughers where you're recording this episode right now? Because I can't see you. So I am in the Hart School kitchen. So this is not my home. My home is where I shoot my show. But um, right now I'm in the Hart School kitchen. Uh, it is the week before students come back when we're recording this. So it's extremely quiet. I'm not you know, <laughs> getting 14 people in the door at any given second to see what we're doing. So uh, I'm, I'm having fun in here just putting away all of my dry goods. <laughs> And my new equipment. <laughs> the it looks really good. There's so many pots and pans hanging behind you and big, oh, yeah. huge refrigerators and yeah. working Those are my space. Wine fridges back there. Ah, yeah. that. and that's just wine only. <laughs> <laughs> wine only. <laughs> Do the students have to be 21 and older then to take any of your courses that have wine yeah, associated with it? Fine. Okay. 
Yeah, to take my beverage classes, they do. But um, if they're going with me to Europe, they only have to be 18. So I teach in France. I teach in Italy. And um, this summer, I'll be teaching in Ireland, Scotland, and England, focusing more on um, Cicerone and mixology and the way that food pairs. There are less wineries in those areas, but we'll be doing some research on the few wineries that exist. But Ireland, Scotland, and England are really known more for their beer culture and um, for their mixology culture. So we'll be doing a little bit of that and then looking at those traditional recipes. And then we're really twisting it all up with uh, just an overview of hospitality because we'll be spending time, a lot of time in hotels and on the road in tour buses and on flights and trains. And they'll be assessing the hospitality of those three UK regions. How long are you going to be away this summer doing that? Uh, well, I'll be gone two weeks to Napa. I leave uh, the fifth of May to go to fourth of May to go to Napa. Right before um, I'll be leaving during exams, and then um, I'll be gone for two weeks to Napa. I get back home for two days and take off to Europe, and uh, that's my big thing this year. And then next year I'll be gone for about three months. I'll be teaching in Florence, Italy. You are a world traveler with all this culinary expertise. That's exciting. Well, I love it because um, I was supposed to retire this this May and uh, or this July. I was supposed you to seem go to far from it. <laughs> I'm 65. So so that's what laughter will do for you. <laughs> so um, I was supposed to leave this May to go to Florence and then come back in July and retire. But due to COVID, I got bumped. So I'll be there next year. And so I am I am sailing out on a plane and coming <laughs> back to my official retirement. So it'll be kind of weird. Oh, what a way to finish it, though. Yeah. That's exciting. Yeah. Wrap it up. <laughs> yeah. And the, but hopefully still doing unwind. I hope so. I hope yeah. so. You know, I'd, I'd love to see this show have legs and just go with it for a few years. And I really would love to do it in retirement when I have more time to focus on the things that I really want to see happen in the show. Um, I, I think that would really be great because Sherry is absolutely amazing. She's the one who puts it all together. I'm the one who creates the food, has the questions for the wineries. I know what I want to see when I'm in the winery, but She's the one who puts it all together. So all of those little snippets that you see, you know, those birds flying through and the, all the graphics and everything, Sherry puts that together. And she's quite an artist. She is definitely an artist. It is a well-produced show. It's really wonderful. You have some really cool episodes. For example, in season three, I saw you did an episode on wine judging with British wine expert Stephen Spurrier and Jay Yeomans, right? Did yes, I say his yes. name? Yes. yes. From the Virginia Governor's Cup competition. And I've never personally seen a wine judging competition in person, let alone the Virginia Governor's Cup competition. So what yes. goes into those and what does one look like? Sure. Well, first of all, um, Steven Spurrier, just a legendary man. Absolutely loved him. If you've ever seen the movie Bottle Shock, a lot of that story was about Steven Spurrier. He is not at all like the character that uh, Alan Rickman played. He was such a soft, gentle, tender man. And I had the fortune of being his very last TV or yeah, TV interview, mm -hmm. his last TV interview. We interviewed him um, late February and he passed away the first part of March last year. So to have had that honor was just tremendous. But this is a man who will make you laugh and cry and uh, want to get out and go further with everything you want to do. And then Jay owns um, Capital Wine School up in D.C. So he really knows his wines. What they do to put together this Governor's Cup is there's a whole um, initial line of judges they are really sorting through, sorting through all of the wines that are, are nominated. And I believe last year there were some 600, 700 wines um, in the running for the Governor's Cup last year. Wow. They narrow it down to, um, to just a few more. 
And then um, to, to just a few. And then um, the last group of judges are really judging the wines that are in that case, the 12 different wines that were chosen as the best. Mm. Which one is going to receive the governor's cup? So there's the governor's case. And then there's the governor's cup. And when the wineries participate in this, they say, yes, we will, um, you know, we will let you have or have it reduced cost. I can't remember what it is. This many of our bottles of this, should we be selected for the case so that at any major event at the governor's mansion, these are the kinds of things that are served um, at the governor's mansion. He really, uh, the governor throughout has focused on the Virginia agricultural system and awarding those wineries that have the very best wines. And we have outstanding wines in the state of Virginia. I mean, I would not have said that 12, 20 years ago. I just didn't. They have come so far and they are the first to tell you we have come so far because the, the wine, you know, it takes a long time to develop the vineyards. It takes a long time to develop style. But I remember working with Dennis Horton back in 1994 when I was um, opening my wine shop. And he was actually recommended to me by Christine Yetzi, who is a friend of mine who um, is now with Winebow. And she was with Country Vintner at the time and uh, developed my wine list. And she said, you know, you really need to talk to him about Virginia wines. Well, at the time, Dennis was really one of the only ones who had great wines. There were maybe 12 who had really good wines. And I don't think there were more than 36 wineries altogether. Now there are nearly 400 wines, wineries. So we've really just scratched the surface with this show. But, um, you know, when you look at how you, you, you want your wines to do really well, so you're going to choose your best wines to go into this competition. Then the judges have a standardized sheet and they have to fill in numbers. It's all the numbers game. That was one thing that Stephen didn't like. Stephen Spurrier said to me, I hate going in and judging wines like this because to me, it's not about a numbers game. It's about the comments and it's about how I feel after I've consumed that wine. And you can't put a number on that. So um, Virginia still judges that way, but uh, there are some competitions out there where it's really all about the comments. It's all about the personal input of the judges. Right now it's a numbers game in Virginia. And then that last group of judges kind of comes together and says, okay, this is really cool. And if you've ever seen the series Psalm, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's Psalm three, I believe it is. Um, Stephen Spurrier played a major role in, in that documentary. And they, they do this wonderful shot to Stephen standing out in his vineyard and then going into his beautiful English cottage. And on his countertop is a bottle of Lee Hartman's Bluestone Chardonnay. No way. The camera is going right into that label. And you can see Lee's signature. You see Bluestone Chardonnay. And it is sitting on Stephen Spurrier's counter in his kitchen because that's what he's serving for dinner. I was like, Virginia wine, look at what we've done. Holy cow. That's amazing. That, that is amazing. Yeah. I'm loving that. I'm also fascinated by how in the world you can uh, figure out who wins based on comments. I get the numbers, yeah. you know, you know, yeah. whatever highest number wins. That makes the logical sense to me. Yeah. But he's the wine expert and he's right, saying, right. hey, this is it. I love to do it this way. But how do you, is it most yeah. flowerful comment or most positive comments? How does that work? So it kind of comes down to that research thing of qualitative and quantitative. Quantitative is easy to assess. And I think that's why most of them do it the numbers way. Qualitative is a little different. So you can have eight different petite Bordeaux come up with about the same numbers, right? But how do you think it blends with food? Mm. Okay. It's a petite Bordeaux. It's a nice petite Bordeaux, but is it food worthy? Is it you know, such and such. So um, a lot of times it's that quantitative, bringing it to the final qualitative. So you might 
you might eliminate a lot of things through that quantitative uh, research and that quantitative judging. But then when it comes down to it, what is really on your palate? What are you really thinking about this wine? And I think that's what he that's what he wanted to see Virginia get to so badly, because it's one thing to bring them all in, do that quantitatively. But then when it comes down to that last bit with those amazing world renowned judges, these are people with palates who know if this wine is going to taste great with food. These are people who know, is this a common petit verdot or is there something spectacular about it? I think that's what he wanted to see. And uh, maybe one of these days we will. Maybe. It sounds like it's a bit more common elsewhere to judge wines this way. Yeah. Or so his way. Yeah, they're quantitative to, to the end. Yeah. And then at that last stage, you know, it's more about uh, these are the people I trust. I want to know what they really think. And sometimes when you put a number on a page, it's not what you really think. You know, it's what you it's what you're assessing based on a, a straight line and not necessarily um, not necessarily on the experience. For, right. Yeah. For the experience, rewarding for the experience, re- rewarding for something that is just spectacular. I see, which is a, a much less definable. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. got it. Yeah. Well, that's really interesting. I'd love to meet somebody like that and talk to them about yeah. it. It's, just, oh, fascinating. it's fascinating. I meet the best people. I just meet some fun people. You <laughs> do. I do. I do. I, where the heck did all this come from for me? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. I really <laughs> love how you just... The takes and the twists that you do with these episodes, and some even have a historical element, like season <laughs> threes. There's in season three, there's an episode French fries, gelato, and Thomas Jefferson, yeah. where the laughers can learn how Jefferson is credited with introducing food favorites to America. Yeah. I want to know what did you learn about Jefferson that most surprised you when you interviewed Richard Leahy, book author and wine ex- expert for that episode? What most surprised you? Well, I always knew that Jefferson was a super foodie, you know, if if that had been out there back in the 70s. <laughs> Jefferson, you're a super foodie. Uh, but, um, you know, Jefferson was so into wine and he was so into food. But I think what really surprised me was um, learning more about the culture of the time. You know, you'd have this little teeny tiny glass that would maybe hold two ounces of wine then. And, you know, how did he how did he take care of that wine, getting it to the United States and then making sure that it was in some sort of a cellar situation where he was able to um, he was able to preserve it, keep it you know, and do what with it, what he needed to do. I, I think just the history of it kind of surprised me it a bit, knowing the weather in Virginia, that kind of thing. But, but watching, you know, what did he pair with these wines? And again, it kind of came back to where it grows is what it goes with mm. because Jefferson brought back these ideas from Paris these were the, the grapes that were growing in Paris. So this was the wine that he brought back. And he wanted to see those foods as close as we could get them in the United States to be paired up with where it grows is where, where it goes. Uh, so, you know, that I think that's one of those things that I learned from Jefferson, um, just kind of looking and observing French fries, gelato, macaroni and cheese, you know, all of these things, steak frites, uh, you know, we weren't eating French fries. And of course, they weren't quite like they are now. However, they did fry them in duck fat, um, which is a big, you know, uh, gourmet thing now here in the United States. So some of those things that that he brought back, it's just, it's so cool to look at. His macaroni and cheese was made with Fontina cheese, which is uh, Italian. So, you know, he didn't get all of his recipes from France. He got a lot from Italy as well. And mixed it up and made yeah. his own thing. Yeah. And gelato, you know, gelato, you think of when I went to Italy, when I was teaching in Italy a couple of years ago, 
the gelato, man, is what you want. It's creamy. It's thick. It's rich. It's dense. It is not made with cream. It's made with milk. So ice cream is made with cream. Gelato is made with milk and it's served at a little warmer temperature so that it's creamier than ice cream. <laughs> so you know, these, these silly things, he brought back gelato and gelato, it's easier to keep it cold with the limited amount of, of ice that you'd have, you know, there are only certain times that you can serve gelato in uh, 18th century Virginia. And he did it in the winter when, which is not, you know, when you traditionally want ice cream, <laughs> but he did it in the winter and he brought ice cream gelato to the U S you know, it's kind of cool. It is really cool. Yeah. yeah that's, yeah. I love the tie in that you bring in the show with Virginia and the wines mm -hmm. and exploration, the history. It's just, it's all yeah. so good. Really love it. Uh -oh. What's your, what's your favorite wine and recipe pairing you've done so far? So it's, it's interesting for me. It depends on if you want a weeknight meal, if you want a throw down snack, or if you want a gourmet meal, one of the best gourmet meals I did I created this recipe that was a wild mushroom rub that I served with um, Kilvac, Kilrock, Kilrock. It's Kilravac, but you say Kilrock um, from uh, Rosemont down mm. in Southern Virginia. And it was an incredible pairing that I absolutely loved. That was in season three. In season four, I had the chance to pair up this wonderful wine uh, from a place called Potomac Point up in Northern Virginia. And it was, it was really a good wine. And I started doing a little research. Okay, if you've got this grape, what are some of the things it goes with? Okay, well, it goes with curry and it goes with cheese and it goes with bread. And I'm thinking, okay, cheese, curry, bread. I think I'm going to do a curried grilled cheese sandwich. Huh. Very different. Yes. Holy cow. One of my favorite pairings yet. It was so good. So it was just like a mayo, a, a red curry mayo that I put a couple other things in. And then um, I used a white cheddar, a yellow cheddar. I used a nice big hearty um, farm bread and then spread it with a little, uh, a little mayo. First time out, it was good. Not quite there. So then I put slices of, um, of heirloom tomato on it and it just totally set it over the top. When I, I, I don't, I don't taste food and then pair wine with it. Mm. I taste wine and I see in my head, taste in my mouth, what I want to pair with it. So I kind of am going about it backwards than most people. You know, if you're a sommelier, you're going to be in a restaurant where people, people aren't going to say, what should I order with this wine? They're going to say, what wine should I order with this food? For yes. me, it's, what food should I order with this wine? Because when I taste the wine, it's kind of like in Ratatouille when the, when the uh, lightning hits and the, the <laughs> cheese fries and the rats just stand in there. And it's yeah. fine. That's the way my brain goes. I taste the wine and all these things are just like, wow, that's hitting my palate. I know what I'm going to try. And, uh, and if I don't, then I go to do some research or even if I taste something and I'm like, oh, this is just a little weird. I don't think people are going to buy into this. I'll start doing research to see if any of my thoughts are at all right, because, you know, I'm me. <laughs> <laughs> a human. <laughs> you could be very wrong <laughs> very wrong <laughs> it's been known to happen you know it's all good <laughs> I, love it. I think we're all there a little bit yeah, that's i i'm curious about that process too if you are there certain types of foods that just come natural that you tend to think about if it's a red versus a white wine yeah yeah um you know white you want to think light Red, you want to think heavier. Um, one of my favorite pairings ever is pork and petite uh, uh, Pinot Noir. Pork and Pinot Noir, just magical because the, the meat is lighter. It's a red meat, but it's lighter. And the red wine is lighter. It's a lighter, thinner skin grape. And so, you know, when you think light with light, 
lighter wine, but you know, some Chardonnays are super heavy. Mm -hmm. Now I'm not a proponent of drinking Chardonnay with steak because it is heavy, but um, you know, some people like it. And I say, if you like it, do it. Yeah. You're all for breaking the rules when it comes to, yeah, I am. (laughs) I am. I am a rule breaker. (laughs) boss. (laughs) Might want to interview the boss. <laughs> you hear the non laughter right now, right? <laughs> yeah, Stephanie is amazing, and she would probably just go, "Yep, she's a rule breaker, but she breaks them well <laughs> <laughs> and makes the show fun." So it's all good. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> and that's how that's how life should be. It should be a lot of fun with great oh, yeah. experiences. Oh you, yeah. This is so good what you're doing. You don't oh, just you. you don't just leave people hanging with the show itself in terms of what you know what they can do with the recipes, what's involved with the recipes. Mm-hmm. You actually on the show's website have the recipes. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We do, we do, and we um, we try to put up as many videos as possible. So you can go to um, if you go to the website it'll say watch and then you can go right now, apparently only season three and four are showing. We've got to make sure that season one and two get up there, but you can go to recipes and it will um, click you through videos of each of those recipes. And, um, and then you can go to the bottom and you can see the whole list of wineries where we've been. And if you click on that, it'll take you to that winery website. So you can see a little bit more about that winery. So, yeah. A couple of things about that. You mentioned earlier we have about 400 wineries. Yeah. And so are the wineries you have listed on your site the ones you've done shows with so far? Is that so what that list is? And, yeah, so far and season four. Now, season four okay. um, shows will populate a couple weeks after they air. So the first, uh, the premiere is January 22nd at, at one o'clock on VPM. But about two weeks later, you can get it streamed um, on the website. So you can go back and, and see that. And um, and then you can find those recipes down in, you know, buried in there. So yeah, that's really great. Yeah, yeah, if you had to give a recommendation to the laughers mm-hmm. uh, with maybe two or three recipes that would help them expand and challenge their culinary skills, what what couple would you recommend for them to try through that through that resource? Sure. Um, I would say if you like dessert, um, I have a a peppermint cheesecake that I did uh, with a wine from, I think it was 868 Vineyards. Yeah, 868 up near um, Harper's Ferry. And that is a super adaptable um, cheesecake recipe. I did I did a, a, a cookie crumb uh, base and then I did the cheesecake blend with white chocolate. You can use dark chocolate. You can use milk chocolate. Uh, you can use all sorts of flavorings. Like if you want to do peppermint, you throw in that peppermint flavoring. If you want to do um, uh, like an orange, you know, you could do a white chocolate with orange and throw in a little orange zest. So for me, recipes, um, uh, recipes are just an idea. And my recipes, I hope, are adaptable enough that, you know, use them, make them your own. They are not, they you know, I, they're my, they're like my, my pride and joy trying to come up with these recipes, but my palate is not going to be exactly like yours. So if you love a different flavor, throw that in for heaven's sakes. I used, um, I want to say coconut cookie crumbs for my peppermint cheesecake and it was killer cheesecake for me, but you know, maybe you don't like coconut. So you're going to use graham crackers or, you know, just because a recipe says that you need to use graham crackers or Oreos or whatever, don't feel like you got to use that. Just flip it up. So that one is one of my favorites. Um, any of my beef recipes where I did rubs are also favorites of mine. And those are more gourmet recipes that are super easy to do. Mm. And for me, it's about making something as elegant as possible 
that anybody can do. Uh, you, you're not going to see my recipes with a bazillion instructions um, because some, you know, nowadays you don't need a bazillion instructions. You don't need to dry this and then, you know, dehydrate this and then blend it or whatever. Just buy it dehydrated. Um, and then um, I would say my bean cassoulet from season three, it's called a uh, quick bean cassoulet or simple bean cassoulet. Cassoulet takes 12 hours to make. This one took an hour. And yeah, it's better the next day. Believe me, because cassoulet is just like that. But from my French heritage, that's one that's really special to me. I, you know, it's I, I, my grandfather was a French pastry chef and he loved good country French food. That was what he grew up on. And, you know, for him, bread and cheese and a glass of wine was everything. And, uh, and he liked those very simple, those simple recipes that cassoulet. And I only wish that he'd lived long enough for me to have cooked for him because I think he would have enjoyed some of the things that come out of my kitchen. I think he would too. Yeah. Although I'm a, I'm a little tripped up right now because I have never had a cassoulet and I do not know what the heck that is. Oh, it's awesome. Can you share with the lappers what that is? Yeah. yeah. So think, think ham and bean soup. Okay. Only this is made with sausages. Um, and I'm not a sausage person. I usually give my husband the sausage, <laughs> but, um, but it's made with sausage, and in the French tradition, it's finished with a little duck confit, which is um, like a, a, a roasted duck leg. And you can actually buy that in the grocery store here. If you go to Martin's, you can buy it in the grocery store. I had no idea. I was like, man, I got a confit of duck. Where am I going to find a duck? But <laughs> I was able to find the duck there, and then I went, oh, well, wait, it's already done for me. So here's the duck confit. So you don't have to put that in, but it's the way that they would have finished that dish. So lots of different beans, super rich broth that that just gets thick as it cooks. And the next day, you know, I, I usually eat it more as a soup the first day. The second day, it's nice and thick and, and almost like a, um, almost like a mashed potato Mm. in mashed potato consistency with that, that broth. But yeah, those are some of the things that I really like, but I have fun putting together every recipe for this show. Um, the soups have been fun. The meats have been fun. I love doing a vegetarian dish. So one thing that I've tried with season four is to put a vegetarian recipe or a non-meat recipe in every show, because there are a lot of people out there who ask me for those um, meat alternatives, and I'm happy to happy to give it to them. <laughs> yeah, now my next question is, why haven't I been in your kitchen? <laughs> yeah. Why? <laughs> Why? <laughs> you need to just come on down here. <laughs> I do. I definitely do. <laughs> well, and my husband, during quarantine, our quarantine project, he built me a pizza oven. What? And I'm not talking just any pizza oven. This is a gourmet pizza oven delight. I mean, it's like a domed pizza oven. So it's Tuscan. Neapolitan pizza ovens are kind of flat like this. And then here's the bottom. So they're kind of, you know, not they're top heavy. A, a Tuscan of it is a half dome. So Brunelleschi's dome from uh, the Duomo. And he built me one of these beautiful, we call it the cathedral. Because it looks like a <laughs> church. I mean, it's just so beautiful. You know, with the slate tiles on the roof and all this stuff. It's gorgeous. And I feature it a couple of times. I featured it. In the uh, in one of the shows, uh, the Philip Carter episode in season three, because Philip Carter was also one of those historic figures um, in Virginia history. And um, and then I featured it this season in season four with uh, Villa Appalachia, which is down in southwest Virginia. And I got down there and they made me pizza. And I was just like and, and all their wines are uh, Italian varietals. And so I said, this is going to be my Brunelleschi dome. <laughs> so, and I have had so much fun with it. I mean, I roast chickens in there. I bake bread. I do pizza. I've made cheesecake in there. And it's just a hoot. It's just a good time. 
Do you have a picture with this oven by any chance? Oh, I do. I do. It's on Facebook. You want me to send it to you? I do, because oh. when we post an audio clip of this episode yeah. with you on our social media, we will use that picture. Oh, you know it. And my husband will love it. That's right. This Is this <laughs> oven inside, outside? Is it's this outside. inside your kitchen? It's outside. It is. It is outside and okay. it is killer. It took us, um, it took my husband, um, I think, uh, two months to build it. And then it has to fire for, um, for a month. You start doing these build up fires. So you get it to a hundred degrees inside for the a next month? day, 200. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're just kind of like increasing it until it's, you know, you get it to the point where it's 1200 degrees inside and it's, it's, are you being, is that literal for a month? You're heating this thing up close to it. I mean, it felt like it, it (laughs) was, uh, yeah, it felt like it, you know, this person who wants pizza, it it felt like it was a month, but, um, I think it was like June 7th. We finally got our first pizza and it was like, whoa, this is really great. I'm loving this. And so now we fire it up once a week, uh, okay. which is the reason that so I'm it's a, the month has been reduced. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yeah, the, the month has been reduced. But holy cow, yeah, and here's a picture of it. Oh, she's showing me. Yeah, yeah. last first when you go to our social media, you'll be able to see it. Yes, that is wonderful. Isn't that awesome? I love it. Yeah, that's so good. Yeah, I get to see it because we're on the Zoom call. So, <laughs> but you all laughers, you can see it on social media for sure. We will. I I'm going to use it. it. I'm going to use I the picture it. with her in front of that pizza, her husband's pizza <laughs> oven he made her. <laughs> that's what we're going to use. It's perfect, and it yeah. it makes great, great pizza. Okay. Yeah. Again, another question. Why haven't I been? <laughs> I Indoors or outdoors, Tassie? It doesn't matter we to gotta me. We got to get you there. We got to get you there. Oh, man. <laughs> We're going to make that happen. This is so good. As we wrap up oh. here, can you share with the laughers how they can follow Unwind on sure. social media or otherwise so they can get more information and see your awesome shows? Sure. So you can um, you can go to my Facebook page, which is Tassie Pippert. I think I'm the only one. And then um, you can also get it at my VPM on Facebook and on Instagram. So and for me on Instagram, it's at Chef's Tassie. And I uh, always try to post the link to the new show as it comes out. Very and good. VPM.org slash unwind or PBS dot org slash show slash unwind slash <laughs> so, that's a few slashes yes it's, it's slash <laughs> slash 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 <laughs> but don't worry about all those slashes laughers because we'll be sure to put that information in the show notes for you as well so you don't have to remember or figure out how many slashes so just be able to click right on it so you can get to it Thank you so much, Tassie. This has been such a pleasure talking to you today about all things Unwind. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me and all of you laughers. Stay tuned for more. Yes, stay tuned for more and be sure to catch the season four premiere and watch previous episodes, get recipes and explore the wineries on the back roads of Virginia at vpm.org forward slash UN hyphen wine. Again, that's bpm.org forward slash UN hyphen wine. Tune in to explore and don't hesitate a second to grab that glass because when you watch one of her shows, it is certainly time to unwind. And lastly, and most importantly, thanks for tuning in, laughers. Out of all the podcasts out there, you picked us and we think that's pretty darn special, just like you. Until next time, keep smiling. Bye. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Virginia is for Laughers podcast brought to you by X2 Comedy. We'll be dropping a new podcast every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So check back for another uplifting episode. Come to an X2 Comedy show or let us bring a show to you. To find out more, head to x2comedy.com. Be sure to share us with a friend. Until next time, cheers. Cheers.